the EP podcast. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found, and always at the eppodcast.com. And belly on up to my nine foot homemade oak bar. Pour yourself a cold one. This is the EP podcast. My name is Chris. One day late because I finally ended up on the COVID 19 list last week, and I had no voice until Monday-ish. So that's why you're getting a show on Tuesday. Sorry about that. This thing just attacks the weakest part of you. And it went after what I used the most. And that's my voice. So uh, I'm a little weak, but I'm going to make it through today. I've got a special guest. I'm going to bring him in here in just a moment. We're going to do the entire show together. By phone, of course, because I'm not completely well yet. And this episode is brought to you by the First National Bank of Evergreen Park. It is a good time, anytime, to teach your kids about money. Help them see the importance of saving money with a Junior Savers account from the First National Bank of Evergreen Park. With a Junior Savers account, children earn interest on every dollar they deposit so they can watch their money grow. Show your kids how rewarding saving can be and learn more at bankevergreenpark.com slash junior savers slash EP. No minimum required open. Member FDIC. Make sure you pop in there and say hi. Grab your EP podcast car magnet in that iconic building at 95th and Pulaski, the first national bank of Evergreen Park. It took two years. I avoided the COVID. I even got my shots. Didn't matter. And I basically couldn't talk for like a week, which was a welcome thing for my family. They were very happy that I couldn't speak. I think my wife loved the fact that her husband was just quiet, sitting on the couch, binge watching television, staying away from the rest of the family while he suffered through his COVID. And because of that, I couldn't record anybody. I couldn't get any show together. But then it hit me. I could bring on my expert and helping me out on today's show, because if you're still recovering from COVID-19, it's always good to have a doctor on board. So I have Dr. (laughs) David Beckman joining me on the phone line right now. How are you, Doc? Doing well, Chris. Hopefully you're doing okay as well. I'm doing a little bit better. I mean, it's. It, I'm going to tell you, it, I I waited two years to get the COVID. I'm, I'm a late arriver to the COVID. There's been a lot of people <laughs> who had the COVID before me. So, I mean, me complaining about getting sick with COVID-19, I think, would annoy some people. I mean, I I, I didn't end up in a hospital. Um, you know, I, 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 I survived it. Uh, it was rough. I mean, I had moments where, like, over the last week or so, where I basically was making promises to God. I was like, God, if I could just start talking again and uh, uh, be able to get more yeah. than two hours of sleep, uh, I swear I will knock off all these things that I'm sure I do that annoy you. Like I was doing, <laughs> I was doing a lot of, a lot of bargaining while I, while yeah, I was a lot ill. Of bargaining. Yeah. Yeah. That's it's kind of how it was. I mean, you've had it before, haven't you? I mean, like I, I'm, everybody's had like a different experience with it with so many different strains. So, I mean, like, but I mean, like I'm still tired. I'm still trying to figure out like, like how to catch my breath, even though I'm at the back end of this thing. Is that normal? So, yes, it's pretty normal. And actually, um, I can tell you that officially I've had COVID twice now. Um, So the first time was very early uh, in April of 2020. Um, And definitely when I got it at that time, the fatigue uh, lasted several weeks and Um, I usually run um, uh, for exercise, and I was not able to run my normal distance until probably four to five weeks after I had COVID the first time. Um, The second time I had it, uh, just, you know, about a month ago, um, I I actually wouldn't have known it was COVID. Um, It felt like a cold, um, and... It uh, and the only reason I ended up testing was because there were a lot of people around us um, that were testing positive, and we were about to go on a trip. And so I'm like, all right, well, let me just see. And unfortunately, I was positive, so we had to adjust plans and things like that. So I think that um, the the tricky thing right now is that. Uh, everyone's talking about Omicron, but there's still um, a, a good amount of circulating uh, Delta variant. Um, and and so there, it, it can be hard to distinguish between the Omicron and the Delta, especially 
if you've been vaccinated and or had an infection before. But from all that we can see right now from the U.S. and all around uh, the world, if you've had a vaccine and or you've had COVID before, most likely if your symptoms are like a cold, it's most likely the Omicron variant. And if you have that kind of uh, that incapacitating fatigue and either loss of sense of smell and taste and uh, just feeling kind of more more like a flu, a, a severe flu, um, that that may actually be Delta. And that's kind of the layman's way of uh, thinking about it. But I think that's kind of how things are holding up right now. You know, my thing, and I, it was it was incredible. Everything pointed to I had like an ear infection. Like I, I, I answered all the questions beforehand and I went through the whole process and, and, and went to the doctor's office and basically sat there and was like, it's my ear. My ear's killing me. I got no fever. I got no other problem. I just got this earache. Like I, I don't get yeah. it. I got this earache. I got some drainage just taking out my vocal cords. Everything else about me feels perfectly fine. And then the test was like, you have, you have COVID. And I was like, I have what? Because I didn't have, like it didn't, in no way did that indicate that I had it. And I think that's the thing with this. This other strain, and it brings me, I guess, to my first question I'm sure a lot of people are really curious about. You know, I'm reading that Omicron is not as deadly and not as harsh as any of these other variants. Then I experience it, and I get sick, and it was miserable. I'll be honest. I was miserable when I had it. But on the other hand, I watched the rest of my family go through this already, and I felt like this was still milder. I didn't feel as nervous when I had it. And now I sit there and I go, okay, fine. Maybe this is a good thing. Maybe as frightening as it is that you're getting this surge of cases, maybe it's a good thing that we've gotten to this point because it seems like every time there's a variant, the virus is trying its hardest to still stay out there. It's trying to stay alive. But to do that, it's making itself less deadly and less dangerous. Am I, is that, is that a right way to look at it or a wrong way to look at it? Well, definitely, um, a, a, a virus only survives if it can if it can spread easily and not kill the host um, in in high numbers. So uh, definitely by just the process of selection, um, most of the time when you have pandemic viruses, they uh, they wind up uh, turning into something that um, is endemic and around all the time, uh, around every, uh, all the time, and then surging at particular times, usually in the fall and winter. Um, and, uh, you know, and they, and they wind up causing illness. And we also, I think, um, have to remember the fact that the flu and even upper respiratory infections, other coronaviruses still still kill people, obviously not at the, at the level that we're seeing with COVID right now. But um, if, you, if you have a compromised immune system, if you're elderly and have a number of other medical issues, COVID or the flu or any other respiratory infection can really set you back. So with Omicron, all the, all the um, data that we're seeing is that the chance of hospitalization and the chance of death is much lower compared to Delta or any of the other previous previous variants. I think the, the, the one question is, is it because the actual strain itself is, is milder or is it because there's just a lot more community immunity from either natural infection or vaccine? And that's something that I think no one can really tease out. I think there are people that think that it's probably a combination of both. Maybe the virus isn't as bad, but there are also a lot more people that have encountered it uh, before. And so it's usually not going to be as bad. And folks, before I continue this podcast, I want to tell you a little bit about my friend, Larry Liebforth. Larry was born and raised right here in Evergreen Park and has been in business for almost 30 years. I continuously see him volunteering his time with local sports associations, helping out the kids, helping raise money for charity. And what you need to know is that Larry is there in case you need some help as well. For nearly 30 years, 
the law offices of Lawrence G. Liebforth have been handling every kind of law you can think of, from personal injury cases to real estate dealings. If you need a will drawn up or representation in a criminal case, it's good to know you have local representation available, rooted in the community with decades of experience. Located over at 4001 West 95th Street in Suite 200, give him a call for any of your legal needs. 708-499-6300. The Law Offices of Lawrence G. Leibforth, here to help you. We're talking with Dr. David Beckman from Family First Medical Group here in Evergreen Park, your FFMG. Uh, dot com. Uh, doctor's been with us since this whole thing started. In, in fact, I think we talked to you for the first time before it had actually hit this country. You've been on this show right. and you've been with us throughout this entire thing. And it's been so nice to be able to talk to uh, a local doctor because I think that the world has lost its mind. I, I kind of want to go on a little rant here and I want to know <laughs> what you think about it. But but here's the thing. I've gotten to the point, Doc, where as somebody that, that came up in the media and worked in professional broadcasting for 10 years and has a broadcast journalism degree and understands when he reads things that are true and are untrue, that at this point, you should be consulting your local doctor, uh, your, your, your trusted physician, and if you want to learn anything about data or coronavirus, go to the CDC website. Because if you're getting your news from Fox News, CNN, MSNBC, all they're trying to do is scare the hell out of you right now. They, this week, yeah. This week, just for a perfect example... There was a headline in CNN, or there was a part of a story in CNN that tried to say that over a thousand children had died of COVID nineteen to this point. And all you have to do is click on CDC.com and see that that number is half. Yeah, and I don't know where they get a thousand because it's not actually there. And then you can see that like twelve hundred kids have died of pneumonia over the same amount of time. Yeah, and I, I'm almost starting to feel like they like they these people wish that children were dying from this because it would get more clicks. This is still something that is not really affecting kids, right? Because I've gotten myself, I've gotten very angry lately, just like w listening to people try to say, oh, we're doing this for the safety of the kids, or we're making this decision because of the safety of the kids, but I still haven't seen kids really getting hurt in, 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 in a number that should make me, I'm, I'm not nervous with my kids. Am I Am yeah. I a lunatic for not being nervous about my kids? Because I, I don't get the, the kid fear out there right now. No, um, you know, I think that, the we we knew very early on i would say in the summer of 2020 uh maybe fall of 2020 uh we knew that thank god um kids seemed to be spared the serious um issues with covid-19 now does that mean that no kids die no of course um every child that dies is is a tragedy and it would be heartbreaking for any family to have to deal with that. But I mean, I think one of the biggest issues that has come up right now is that there's been a lack of um, risk uh, mitigation, or I'm sorry, a lot of uh, lack of evaluating risk and benefit in everyday life, especially when it comes to kids. So where we, we should have been um, saying in the, in the media and health leaders should have been saying, hey guys, the good news about this is that if kids get it, most of the time they're fine. Um, and so you don't have to worry. Does it mean that you're reckless and careless and you send kids that are sick out um, to visit elderly and vulnerable people? No, but it, it means that um, it, for all intents and purposes, kids should be living as close to a pre-coronavirus uh, life as they as they can, um, and that and that's held true uh, back in 2020, um, all the way till now. And you'll see that actually um, the the report well the reporting hasn't changed, but you'll see that the uh, the CDC is actually subtly changing the way that they talk about this because. You know, in the past, whenever you talked about um, kids uh, being hospitalized, it was like people would ask questions, well, are they hospitalized with COVID or are they hospitalized with something else and found to have COVID incidentally? And um, people were uh, being called anti-science and 
were being silenced for even asking that question. And, and just in the last few weeks, um, the, the CDC and, uh, and Fauci have come out and they've said, um, well, you know, a lot of these kids that are hospitalized are incidentally found to have COVID. And so that's something that's, that we've, we've known. Many people have said, unfortunately, it's been a message that hasn't been conveyed in an effective way to the public. And you're right, it's, it's led to fear. And a perfect example of that is uh, multiple hospitals that are actually pleading with the public to not come to the emergency room to find out whether they have COVID or come to the emergency room to get a COVID test. And that's what a lot of ERs have been dealing with is people that are afraid and they need to get a test and they and, and their last resort is to go to the ER. And so they're clogging up ERs trying to find out if they have COVID or not when they're actually feeling fine. That's crazy. Now, so here, I, I want to kind of like give you some things that I've kind of, I don't know, I think I think having it, I think seeing it go through my my house, I think becoming an informed person who can who can not only listen to people like you, but can click on a website like CDC, you know, just just go to it and actually just look at data on a chart and be like, I can read this. I can understand this. I have a college degree. I can read this. I'm not a doctor, but I can read this. I understand what it actually says. Yeah. Then I've, I've kind of come to the conclusion that, first of all, as time goes on here, every variant is going to become more and more contagious. And eventually... There's not very much you're going to be able to do to avoid COVID. That's right. Like, I, I, I understand the idea behind we want people to get vaccines. But if you stand, if you, if you sit there and say you can't walk into this building or be in this room without a vaccine card, well, everybody in the entire place could have a vaccine card. They could all sit down inside of a place with their vaccine. They could all take their mask off and start eating in the restaurant. And they could all pass it to each other because the vaccinated can pass it to each other. So it, it seems like some of these mitigations that we're doing – don't really do anything anymore. And and like in and you're seeing people that are that that have all their vaccines and their boosters and everything else, they're still catching it. So essentially, I don't know like do you think there's a point where the medical community is gonna sit there and start saying, Hey, look, I know this made sense a year ago or a year and a half ago, but at this point, some of the stuff that we're doing really is just for show. Am I, am I nuts to see, to see it that way? Am, am I being too reckless saying something like that? I mean, do you think that these mitigation things still actually have some sort of impact? Um, n- no, I, th- I think the, the mitigation that, that we're doing and that we've done up to this point has been, um, has had very little effect on spread. And we knew that before COVID, we knew that um, masking with influenza didn't really make any difference. I mean, every study that looked at masking of respiratory viruses before the pandemic concluded that um, they weren't really effective at stopping a respiratory virus. Um, and even in the beginning of the pandemic, that was something that was being said. And then I think all of a sudden it shifted. And I think it shifted because of uh, fear of, of the unknown and because we felt like we didn't have any tools. And so we thought, well, even if masking doesn't do that much, if everyone masks, maybe we can stop the spread a little bit better. Um, and so that was something that was, that was tried. The problem is that since that time, there have been several studies that have looked at masking um, and found very little, if any, benefit of masking. Certainly, there have been studies that have come out showing that cloth masks do absolutely nothing. And that was actually the, the um, that was known before Omicron and now with Omicron, the fact that it's so contagious. I mean, a cloth mask really, I mean, you're, <laughs> it's, it's really not doing anything there. Um, so, there, there are there are physicians, and I mean they're not the voices that you see on the ma- on the media, but there are physicians that um, that are at uh, reputable institutions, Stanford, Harvard, Johns Hopkins, that have questioned 
the mitigation methods that we've used and the utility, especially when it comes to kids. Um, and, you know, in the past, they were looked at as um, being fringe. And I think part of the reason for that is because many things with this pandemic have been politicized. So you you would have people that would say, I don't know if masks do much. And the only people that would interview those physicians would be people on Fox News. And then the the opposite was true, right? So people that were like, everyone's going to die and your kids are really, really uh, are, are in danger. All of those physicians would go on CNN or MSNBC. And so these, these positions got hardened. And so I think there are some people that will hold on to those mitigation methods as long as possible because it makes them money and it gives them notoriety. And then there are other people that I think are starting to come around and say, you know what, I don't know if this is really that great. And I think the biggest example of that is with uh, masking, saying, well, now um, you should probably upgrade your mask to N95. I think that maybe you can debate that in certain situations, but I think the correct conclusion there is if everyone or the majority of people have been wearing cloth masks to this point and they haven't done much and overall people have been that have wanted a vaccine, have gotten vaccinated, you're at a point where it's like, okay, now if you want to wear an N95, that's all about you and your personal protection if you want to do that and, and you want to take that extra step, I think by all means you should do that. But to mandate it for everyone else, um, vaccinated or not, makes no sense because it's clear that a vaccinated person and an unvaccinated person can spread COVID, can get COVID, and a mandate makes no sense. Building relationships, supporting the community, and service. These are the things that Country Financial stands for. They're more than just an office you may pass by as you drive through Evergreen Park. They're neighbors who lend a helping hand and support the fabric of your community, including charitable organizations, sports, financial education, and civic organizations. And since Country is already your neighbor, they want to get together and chat. Call your local Country Financial representative, Mike Thauer, today at 708 425 1559 to talk about the things that are important to you and how he can help you protect them. We're talking with Dr. David Beckman from Family First Medical Group. He's nice enough to join me basically because I couldn't even do a show last week, Doc. I couldn't speak. I couldn't do an interview. I couldn't I couldn't put anything together for this this week. We're putting this thing out a day late because I'm finally able to talk on a Monday and you've saved my butt to be able to sit down and talk with me. And I've had a whole week to sit down and think about what what kind of predicament we're in here with COVID-19. And, and I talked to business owners uh, over the last month or so, especially now with the whole vaccine card thing in, in, in Cook County and in mm-hmm. Chicago, yeah. who are telling me that they, they, they can't get anybody to walk into their place because you have people that the people that are afraid who want to show the vaccine cards are still too nervous to go out. And the people that are more, I don't want to show a vaccine card have basically said, I'm never coming into your place and eating again. And so, like, yeah. it's, there, there's all this stuff going on I don't think people are aware of right now. And I, I find it interesting as you're sitting there and you're talking about the mitigations, I want to talk about the vaccines real quick. I am a believer in the fact that the vaccine prevents people from dying. Like, I think that the vaccine drastically lowers your chances of dying from COVID-19. I'm glad my parents have it. And when I was sick this week, it gave me a little bit of comfort to know that I had had my vaccine, that I had had my Moderna. On the other hand, I don't know. I mean, is it really a vaccine? Are we using the wrong word for it? Because like when I got my measles, mumps and rubella shot, it didn't mean that I was going to get the measles every six months. And yet I could still catch COVID. It seems like every six months because this thing just kind of like it, it lowers my risk factor. Have we used some of the wrong terminology for these things? Well, I think, um, you know, when it, when it comes to vaccines, probably the confusion is that when the vaccines came out initially, the thought was that they were, they provided what's called sterilizing immunity, where you, you get a vaccine and you're basically 
impenetrable by the virus. And um, and there are some vaccines that do that, of course, like the a lot of the pediatric vaccines, the polio vaccine, um, the uh, MMR vaccine. You know, these are vaccines that are very effective and um, basically make it impossible for you to get that virus after you get it. But the COVID vaccine, I think, is um, should be thought of more as a flu vaccine, which is um, uh, in a good year, a flu vaccine, I think, is 55, 60% effective at preventing you from getting sick. But many years, it's actually less than 50%. And in some years, it's as bad as 20 or 25% of preventing infection because um, when those vaccines are developed, it's basically looking for what the predominant viruses and strains are going to be circulating um, in the community. And sometimes you you guess right and other times you don't. And so I think that the, the confusion with this vaccine is that um, it was billed as being 95, 98% effective at preventing you from even getting COVID. And that's, um, and that's the messaging that, uh, that came out of the drug man- manufacturers as well as our health officials. And I think that that was more out of optimism. Um, the trials were very small. It was really early in the, in the pandemic and it was with um, only, a, uh, only about four to six weeks of data at that point. So you could say that they were 95% effective to that point. But as this is stretched on, um, what we see is that obviously the virus mutates there, it starts to escape the protection of the vaccine. And um, with coronaviruses and flu viruses, they do mutate. And because it's mutated, um, the, your, your body's ability to fight off the initial infection is not as good. Now, you still have memory immunity, memory B and T cells that fight off the infection, which is why, yes, I agree with you, it's been shown that this vaccine is very effective at preventing all of the worst and most severe outcomes. And so even though there are still some people that are vaccinated that get hospitalized, um, the vast majority of people that get the serious cases are unvaccinated. And it's because their first encounter with a virus, they have zero immunity. They have no natural infection and they have no memory immunity from a vaccine. So they get hit by the virus and the body has no idea what it is. And so that's why some people can get really, really sick. So I think it's a good way to talk about the vaccine. Like, hey, get this shot. You may still get COVID, but it, it'll be an upper respiratory infection. You'll, you'll be sick for a few days. You'll maybe not feel great for a couple weeks. But at the end of the day, you'll get back to work and living your life versus, you know, you might get COVID and you might have a lot of trouble breathing and you might wind up in the hospital. So that's, I think, the benefit of this vaccine. Dr. David Beckman, before I let you go, one more question, and it's really been proposed uh, to me by my father. Uh, he was, he, I was talking to him today, and he goes, uh, he goes, you got the doctor coming on? I go, yeah. And he goes, I got a question for you. And I'm going kind of, to kind of take his question and expand it a little bit here so it applies to everybody. He is in his 70s, and he had two shots. He got two Moderna shots, okay? And yeah. he was getting ready to get the booster, but instead he got COVID. And he just had COVID oh. recently. So okay. he got through it. My mother got through it. They never got their booster, but they've had two shots of Moderna. And now they've gone through COVID, confirmed COVID, and they've survived that. And they're back on their feet again. And then you look at the fact that maybe you got kids who probably before they even got vaccinated had COVID. Think of all the kids in the neighborhood yeah. over the last year and a half that have already had COVID. How yeah. much concern is there to run out and either get your first vaccination if you've got a kid that had COVID already, or if you're somebody who's already had two and you've got, and you've gone through COVID, like at some point, does the body learn enough 
that they don't have to keep running out and getting more and more shots? Does the body get used to this enough that it won't be fatal and that they don't have to worry about going out and constantly getting shots down the line? That that's a, that's a really good question. Um, and I think, um, it, it's different. I would say it's different in each scenario. So, um, with your, with your father and your parents and anyone that's, that's older, um, if they've recently had COVID, um, that's essentially like a booster. And so, um, you know, you got a natural booster and there's studies that show that the most protected people are actually people that have had COVID and had a vaccine. Um, you, you have a hybrid immunity and the hybrid immunity tends to be, um, better at protecting you from more serious illness in the future. Um, with the boosters, unfortunately, what we're seeing is that, um, the, the whole reason to boost has been primarily to try to avoid getting a symptomatic case of COVID because we already know that the two doses um, really protect you from getting the severe issues with COVID. So the booster is mainly um, just trying not to get sick, just trying not to get any illness at all. And what we've seen with some uh, early data from Denmark and the UK is that um, after a booster, um, it's only about 35% effective at preventing infection um, 10 weeks out. So you think about a booster giving you maybe a bubble for three months, which is why uh, places like Israel are now talking about a fourth dose. It works out to a vaccine every three months. Um, I don't think that that's a feasible um, strategy for the majority of people. I would say that for people that are um, immunocompromised and people that are really more vulnerable, that might be something that you think about uh, getting in three months. But with your dad, I would say if he recently had COVID, I probably wouldn't think about doing another booster until three months from now. And it would depend on what the scenario or what the situation is in the U.S. In three months, if there's very little circulating virus, then maybe you delay it until the fall or winter and you get a booster at that time. And maybe by that time we have a different booster that uh, protects against the current strain um, instead of the original strain. And then very quickly with the kids, um, a kid that has had COVID um, from the Pfizer trial, uh, there were no kids that had COVID before um, that got it again without a vaccine. Now, again, that was a short, a short window, and it was before Omicron, which is more contagious, of course. So... Uh, there are a lot more people that are getting reinfected with the Omicron than pre-Omicron. So I think this virus is different enough that there's a chance that some a, a child that had COVID before could get this again. However, it's still likely that it's going to be a mild case. It's still likely that they'll be fine, especially if they had a if they did okay with their initial infection. All right, Doc, I appreciate you jumping on the show and talking with me. And uh, I appreciate you talking so much because I'm still out of breath because this thing's no <laughs> joke. I mean, I'm going to tell you, this, yeah. thing, this COVID thing's no joke. I mean, I I, I, I appreciate you coming on and talking sense. It, it is really kind of a nasty little disease. And uh, it, yeah. it, it, it really, I mean, it, I compare it to like one of the worst flus that I've ever had. And I, I hated every moment of it. And I feel like I'll be probably tired for a couple of weeks and I'm not going to be a hundred percent. And I, I take breaks after I talk, like as soon as we're done talking, I'm going to have to go sit on the couch for an hour and kind of like think about my life and try to get my, my, my energy back here. Um, <laughs> as, you know, because it, it, it is, it is not like an easy thing to go through. I also though, and I think what, and what you've kind of conveyed to me is that I, I, I don't think I'm that far off. I also though feel far more comfortable in the world today than I felt two years ago or even a year Definitely. ago. And that, and, yeah. and, and, you know, if you, if you feel as though you need to get the extra protection, go out and get the vaccine. I'm going to say for adults, it makes perfect sense. 
You know, I I think to myself, I could have been a lot worse if I hadn't gone and gotten it. I mean, I got a business. I, what if I couldn't talk for three weeks? What if I would end up in the hospital or God forbid something right. worse? So I'm glad I'm glad I got it. On the other hand, I also think we've kind of lost our mind. We're, we're checking people for vaccine cards. We're, we're, we're worried about uh, uh, whether or not a kid's mask slips off their nose in school. I mean, like there's some things we got to kind of like take a step back and say, why are we acting so crazy? Because this isn't going away. This is going to be always here. And we've got to kind of try to find a way to live with it. Right. Definitely. That, that's that's how we have to move forward. And you're right. All, all of those conclusions are right. The vaccine is going to help you get help prevent you from getting more ill. But yeah, I mean, we need to learn to live with this virus. Um, we take the shot if, if we want to lower that risk and and then we move on um, and and just uh, and just kind of evaluate it as time goes on. Well, listen, I, I do know the secret, though, to, to, to fending off COVID. I want you to do a little bit of research on this. OK, I okay. went I went on the bourbon trail beginning of December. One of the guys on the bourbon trail with me doesn't like bourbon. Everybody else in the entire group didn't catch COVID. He had three shots, three of them, even at his booster. He ended up with COVID. <laughs> Even the guy that was rooming with him in the hotel room didn't get it. The bourbon killed it. I stopped drinking bourbon for three days, Doc. Three days. All right? Uh, and I got COVID. I mean, as soon as I can get that bottle back in my hand, that's it. From now on, I'm like I'm like a cowboy from 1885. That's how I'm going from now on. That'll protect me against there, COVID. There you go. You just got to get Pfizer to back you, and maybe, <laughs> maybe you can. <laughs> as long as there's enough money in it for him, I'm sure they would. Thank you so much, Dr. Beckman. Check him out at Family First Medical Group right here in Evergreen Park, yourffmg.com. Thanks a lot, Doc. Thank you. Bye-bye. Another show is wrapped up. Another show's in the books. Another show is wrapped up. And then by the looks, it's going to be a good one. And we'll see you next week. And the nude is basement. And the nude is basement. Another show is wrapped up. Another show is wrapped up. Another show is wrapped up. And it's in the books. Another show is wrapped up. Another show is wrapped up. And by the looks, it's gonna be a good one. Nude is basement. Broadcast basement. The Nudist Basement The Broad Basement Slancha The EP Podcast Heard everywhere podcasts can be found And always at the eppodcast.com